The RMS Titanic was the second White Star Line Olympic class ocean liner, the first being RMS Olympic and the third being HMHS Britannic. She was 269 metres long, 28 metres wide and 72 metres tall from the bottom of her keel to the top of her masts. At 46,328 tonnes, she was the largest ship built at the time, being only slightly bigger than Olympic. Olympic and Titanic were the 400th and 401st hulls laid by shipbuilders Harland and Wolfe in their Belfast shipyard in Northern Ireland. The two ships were built side by side, with work on the Olympic begun first. Everything on RMS Titanic was massive. This centre anchor was at the time the largest anchor forged by hand and weighed in at over 15 tonnes. The centre anchor and the two bower anchors were made by Noah Hingley and Sons in their workshop in Dudley, England. The anchors were transported to Belfast by horse, train and ship before being installed. It took three years to construct Titanic, but by the 2nd of April 1912, Titanic was completed and taken out to the Irish Sea for her trials. She was certified as seaworthy by the British Board of Trade and ready for her maiden voyage. She would be servicing the transatlantic route, a journey from Southampton, England to New York, USA, with stops at Cherbourg, France and Queenstown, Ireland. RMS Titanic carried mail and cargo as well as passengers. She had six cargo hatches with numbers 1, 2 and 3 forward and 4, 5 and 6 aft. On our left is the number 1 hatch the access point for the forwardmost cargo hold. The hatch cover can be found lying about 100 metres in front of the bow. It was blown off this hatch when the bow impacted the ocean floor and the water inside was forced up and out of the ship. After departing Southampton on the afternoon of Wednesday the 10th of April, RMS Titanic began her 5,360 kilometres journey to New York City. She was due to arrive in the early hours of Wednesday the 17th of April, but with calm ocean conditions and good weather, it was possible she could arrive early on Tuesday evening instead. The night of the 14th of April was moonless and a light fog was developing on the horizon. Titanic's captain Edward Smith had received a number of ice warnings during the day and had changed their course so they were further south to avoid the affected areas. The captain retired to bed and First Officer William Murdoch took charge of the bridge as officer of the watch. Titanic steamed ahead through the night while lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee searched the horizon for small ice. They were standing here in the crow's nest when at 11.40pm Fleet spotted an iceberg directly ahead. He rang the warning bell three times to indicate an obstacle ahead and phoned the bridge. Murdoch gave the order, hard a starboard, and the ship turned to port, but it was too late. Titanic struck the iceberg on her starboard side. The impact buckled hull plates and sheared rivets, revealing her six compartments to the ocean. You can see here the remains of the crow's nest platform and the mounting bracket for the bell above the access hole. The bell and telephone can be found lying in the debris field. The lookouts would climb up a ladder on the inside of this mast to reach the crow's nest. Both Lee and Fleet didn't believe Titanic had struck the iceberg hard and thought it was just a close shave. They didn't realise the seriousness of the situation until they arrived on the boat deck and were ordered into lifeboats. We are now heading down the number two hatch to reach the main cargo hold and mail room. We're passing by decks D, E, F and G which housed the third-class open space and cabins for third-class single men and crew. Third-class single women and families were accommodated in the stern. The D-deck open space was a large sheltered area with bench seats, small tables and a bar. Steerage passengers used this space to walk, socialise and to listen to music. They were expected to create their own entertainment and some passengers brought their instruments with them on the journey. The third class passengers held a dance party here on the night of the sinking. The crew staying in this section were mostly firemen, trimmers and greasers. These crewmen worked in the hot and dirty boiler and engine rooms, shoveling coal and greasing machinery. Because of this, they had their own special wash areas and slept in rooms away from passengers. They accessed their work areas through a passageway under the cargo hold below. Titanic contained 15 bulkheads 
thick walls that separate her lower decks into 16 watertight compartments. It was a new design technique that meant Titanic could stay afloat with up to four of her compartments damaged and led to her being considered unsinkable. Unfortunately, the collision with the iceberg opened six compartments. Within the first 15 minutes, this cargo hold was underwater and the third class accommodation on G deck above was starting to fill with water. This hold was used to store cargo for passengers and businesses being transported across the Atlantic. Among the crates of fabrics, furniture and food products, there were also a few unusual items, including orchids, dragon's blood, barrels of mercury and a brand new Renault automobile. Some of the more expensive items being carried included Egyptian artefacts heading for the Denver Museum, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and the Le Circassiano Ben painting by Blondel. These items were most likely held in the first class baggage area next door but were lost along with the mail room when that section filled with water 20 minutes after the collision. We are now going to head through to the mail room on the other side of this bulkhead. RMS Titanic was registered as a Royal Mail steamer and contracted to transport mail across the Atlantic. RMS liners were favourable with passengers as they were considered more reliable to arrive at their destination on time. Titanic had a mail room and post office on board with five dedicated post office workers. This team consisted of two British and three American clerks and together they sorted up to 60,000 letters per day. John Jago Smith and James Williamson were from the British Royal Mail and William Gwynne, John March and Oscar Woody were from the US Postal Service. They worked in both this room and the sorting room upstairs and their sleeping quarters can be found above on F deck. There were roughly 200 bags of registered mail and 3,500 standard mail bags on board, meaning a total of roughly 7 million pieces of mail and 700 parcels were lost in the sinking. The iceberg damage ran directly across the starboard side of this room, leading to this space flooding early in the night. The five clerks worked tirelessly to try and save the mail and managed to carry 200 mail bags up these stairs to the sorting room. Only a few minutes later, the water had reached this level and they moved what they could to D-deck. Their final movements aren't known and sadly, all five mail clerks died in the sinking. As the iceberg slid down the side of the ship, Murdoch ordered a hard aport, swinging Titanic stern out of the path of the iceberg. He also closed the watertight doors, isolating the flooding to those damaged compartments. The forward three hatches, along with the peak tank and boiler rooms 5 and 6 were breached. The openings were long and thin where the iron plating had separated and exposed a total area of little over 1 metre squared. After the collision, RMS Titanic stopped and almost immediately took a starboard list. The captain organised a group to go below and inspect the ship for damage. When they returned, Chief Designer Thomas Andrews was summoned to the bridge and given the damage report. Knowing the volume of each breached compartment and the initial rate of flooding, he calculated Titanic would sink within 60 to 90 minutes. The captain gave the order for the lifeboats to be prepared. Passengers who were woken by the impact were starting to make their way onto the decks. Many found large chunks of ice here on the forward well deck and shaved ice falling through open portholes on sea deck. Third class men had an impromptu football match and first class passengers joked about keeping pieces of ice as souvenirs for the journey. While exciting, passengers didn't believe they were in any danger and most returned to their cabins soon after. We're now moving up to the bridge and then over to the Marconi radio room. RMS Titanic was not only luxurious but also the height of technology at the time. She had a Marconi radio set on board and could send messages to other ships and stations up to 3,200 kilometres away. The fore and aft masts suspended the Marconi twin T-type aerials, four cables that transmitted the radio signals across the ocean. The top of this mast rests on the collapsed navigation bridge, where the officer of the watch would stand and direct the ship. The smaller, sheltered room at the back was called the wheelhouse, and it was here the quartermaster stood at the helm and piloted the ship. You can see the outline of the wheelhouse walls on the floor. 
This telemotor is all that is left of the wheel and along with the commemorative plaques serves as a stark reminder of the events of that night. Titanic carried just 20 lifeboats, four more than required by the regulations outlined by the British Board of Trade. There were 14 regular wooden lifeboats, two smaller cutters and four Engelhardt collapsible boats. The total capacity of these lifeboats was only 1,178 people, far less than the total on board. This fact must have weighed heavily on the captain's mind as he specified the boats to be filled with women and children first. Many passengers refused to board lifeboats, believing they would be safer on board Titanic. Just over an hour after the collision, the first lifeboat left the sinking ship. By 2am, only her four collapsible lifeboats remained unlaunched. This is Davit number one, the only Davit remaining in a standing position on the wreck. It was used by First Officer Murdoch to lower lifeboat one and collapsible C and was in the process of lowering collapsible A when the bridge suddenly ducked under the water at 2.15am. The officers, crew and passengers alike were washed from the decks by the resulting wave and the lifeboat floated away upright and empty. This hole is where the forward-most funnel was situated. As the bow dipped under the surface, the funnel fell forward and crushed the starboard bridge wing and the people swimming in the water nearby. The stern rose out of the water, peaking at an angle of around 15 degrees. This placed stress on Titanic's keel, which buckled and twisted, tearing the ship in half and sending the waterlogged bow plummeting to the ocean floor. The tear wasn't clean, with the decks failing to hold at varying positions. The stern, now rapidly filling with water, bobbed on the surface for a few minutes before slipping under. Those in lifeboats had rowed far away from the ship for fear of being pulled under by the suction as Titanic sank. They were now left to decide whether they remained safe in their boat or try to rescue some of the 1,500 people floating in the freezing water. If they returned to the wreckage, they risked being capsized by panic swimmers trying to climb into their lifeboat. It was a hard decision and many decided the risk was too great. Only three boats pulled people from the ocean that night. Most people in the water succumbed to hypothermia within 15 to 20 minutes, their life belts keeping them afloat. A few managed to make their way to the unlaunched collapsibles A and B and pulled themselves aboard. Here they waited, in the dark, not knowing how long they would be floating on the open sea. The opening ahead of us is the Marconi room skylight. We're now going to descend into the room to learn about the rescue. Throughout the night, senior operator Jack Phillips worked the 5 kilowatt Marconi wireless radio set to send out distress signals using both the old CQD and new SOS call codes. He alerted nearby ships to their position and status and received updates of ship locations and estimated arrival times. Junior operator Harold Bride took these updates to Captain Smith and passed the captain's responses back to Phillips for transmission. RMS Carpathia radio operator Harold Cottam was off duty and about to go to bed when he decided to listen in to the nightly news from Cape Cod. Operators there mentioned they had ice warnings for Titanic and Cottam decided to pass on the message. He was surprised when Phillips responded to his call with a CQD and gave Titanic's location. Cottam immediately took the message to Carpathia's captain, Arthur Rostron, who ordered all hands on deck and told Cottam to let Titanic know they were on their way. These calls for assistance were only possible with the help of the Titanic's engineers working down in the ship's engine room. The dynamos powered the ship's lights, water pumps and Marconi equipment. As Titanic took on more water, her engines began to fail and the signal strength weakened. Bride adjusted the current and motor speed to find the strongest spark, while Phillips tested the equipment in the room next door. Bride's final settings can be seen on the wall here. When water reached the boat deck, the operators left their station, with Bride heading towards the port bow and Phillips to the starboard stern. After the wave washed over the decks, Bride found himself in the water underneath collapsible B and managed to climb aboard. Phillips was lost in the sinking. 
RMS Titanic was carrying an estimated 2,208 passengers and crew, with only 712 surviving the disaster. Those who survived spent the night floating in darkness until RMS Carpathia arrived around 4am. Captain Rostron had pushed the Connard liner to break her speed record, but it wasn't enough. Titanic had sunk before Carpathia arrived and they found 20 lifeboats at Titanic's location. Unfortunately, the exact number of victims is unknown, as there were many last-minute ticket purchases and cancellations, and the documentation was lost along with the ship. Of the 1,317 known passengers, over half were travelling third class, or steerage as it was called. These passengers couldn't access the boat deck without entering second class or crew areas, meaning many were unaware how to get to the lifeboats and escape the sinking. Passengers from different classes were strictly separated and not allowed to visit each other's areas. This was mainly for health and immigration reasons, as all third-class passengers emigrating to the United States were taken to Ellis Island for a health check and processing before being allowed to enter the mainland. The US government was concerned about diseases entering the country, and all ships transporting people to the United States had to adhere to the segregation laws. First and second class passengers had no issues making their way to the boat deck, as staircases provided both classes direct access. This forward grand staircase is one of the most iconic spaces within the ship and linked the floors accessible to first class from the boat deck through to F deck. Each deck contained stylized cabins, common spaces and state-of-the-art facilities. A deck comprised of the first class lounge, promenade, reading room and smoking room. The first class smoking room contained the only functional fireplace on the ship. All cabins and other passenger areas of the ship contained either false fireplaces or electric heaters. The deck included the two millionaire suites, the largest suites on the ship, both with private promenades. This deck also included the a la carte restaurant and Café Parisienne, both managed by restaurateur Luigi Gatti. This restaurant and cafe were not included in the travelling fare, like the dining saloon, and tables needed to be booked ahead of time. Sea Deck was known as the Shelter Deck and contained first-class accommodation along with a first-class barber shop, inquiry office and purser's office. It was the highest deck to run the length of the ship uninterrupted. There were 135 first-class cabins and two sitting rooms on this deck, able to accommodate up to 315 passengers. Like all other decks on Titanic, there were no room number 13. The deck also contained the second-class library and third-class general and smoking rooms. These were situated in the stern section, currently located 600 metres south of the bow. There were two purser's offices on board, one for first class and one for second class. The offices were run by six pursers who handled passenger inquiries, cash and valuables in the safe and issued tickets to the Turkish baths and swimming pool on F deck. First and second class passengers needed to register their arrival at their respective purser's office and they were given maps of the ship. This office was also the first point of call if first class passengers wished to send telegraph messages using the new wireless technology on board. Chief purser Hugh McElroy was well known among the first class passengers and crew, having served on White Star liners for 13 years. He often dined alongside passengers in the restaurant. During the cross-channel journey, McElroy kept a canary in his cabin, minding it during its delivery to a friend in Cherbourg. On the night of the accident, he was seen assisting with loading and lowering lifeboat 9. He helped women enter the boat and spoke with owner Bruce Ismay. He was also seen on deck speaking with assistant purser Reginald Barker and surgeons William O'Loughlin and John Simpson. The friends were standing silently watching the last boats being lowered and spoke briefly with officer Lightoller before shaking hands and saying their goodbyes. The sitting room, one of the most recognisable on board Titanic, was part of a parlour suite occupied by the Strausses. 
It was decorated in the Regency style with mahogany furniture and gilt panels. It was the only room on board in this style and you can still see the golden clock sitting on the mantelpiece surrounded by debris. The bedroom next door also contained mahogany furniture, this time contrasting with the white gilt panelling and decorated in the Empire style. Isidore Strauss was one of the owners of Macy's department store and he and his wife Ida were returning home to the United States after visiting Europe for the winter. Their adult son Jesse was travelling with his young family from New York towards Europe on board the liner SS America and their ships crossed paths in the afternoon of the 14th of April. Isidore sent a short message to Jesse that afternoon, noting the fine weather they had experienced. Unfortunately, Jesse wouldn't learn of his parents' fate until some four days later. The elderly couple were woken by the slight bump as Titanic struck the iceberg and made their way up onto the deck after waking their maid and valet. When the time came for Ida to board lifeboat 8, she entered the lifeboat but then realised her husband would have to stay on board. She stepped back out. Isidore and others tried to convince her to re-enter the boat but she refused to leave without her husband. Ida helped their maid Ellen Bird into the boat and wrapped her fur coat around Ellen, saying she wouldn't be needing it anymore. Isidore and Ida were last seen sitting in deck chairs on the A-deck promenade holding hands. Isidore's body was recovered from the ocean, but Ida's was never found. The Strauss's parlour suite was just one of many specially designed first-class rooms. The 77 large state rooms were decorated in a range of different period styles. Titanic was designed to be the height of opulence and the first-class common areas were the most luxurious. She mostly followed Olympic's design, but White Star Line made many changes to Titanic's layout and fixtures due to feedback from Olympic's maiden voyage. Some design changes can be seen on D-Deck. D-Deck was the saloon deck and contained the first class reception and both the first and second class saloons. This was also the highest deck to accommodate all three classes. This reception room was possibly the most utilised first class space on the ship. It extends the full width of the ship and was decorated Jacobean style with raised ceilings, white carved panelling and dark green carpet. The arched windows on the sides allowed natural lighting during the day and were lit at night by electric lights hidden behind the glass. White wicker furniture with green cushions and potted palms completed the look, keeping the space open. A Steinway grand piano sat in the corner and was played as part of a quintet during afternoon tea and in the evenings. Passengers would sit and listen to the band before heading to dinner in either the B-Deck restaurant or through the double doors to the First Class Saloon. Percy Fletcher, the ship's bugler, called passengers to their evening meals by playing the old roast beef of England at various locations around the ship.
First class passengers boarded and departed the ship via the gangway doors on either side of this room, or by the gangway doors directly above on B deck. These lobbies were larger on Olympic and extended out into the reception area. During Olympic's maiden voyage, White Star officials noticed crowding in the reception area each night after dinner and decided to extend the reception area on Titanic. They also redesigned the small reception area near the B-Deck restaurant to split the crowd and added additional seating in both areas. These three elevators serviced only the first class passengers and ran from A-Deck to E-Deck. A fourth elevator was available off the second class staircase and was the first elevator to be available for second class on any White Star liner. As no photographs exist of Titanic's forward grand staircase or elevators, it was assumed they were exact copies of those found on Olympic. It wasn't until film director James Cameron explored this area with an ROV that it was discovered the intricate design of their grills is different to that on Olympic. Not a lot of sea life lives at this depth, but since discovering the wreck we've learned quite a bit about the ones that do. So far, 24 species of invertebrates have been discovered around the wreck, including crabs, coral and sea stars. There have also been four species of fish found, with the rat tail or grenadier fish being one of the more common species. They can grow up to a metre long and can be found both inside and outside the wreck. E-Deck was also known as the Upper Deck and provided accommodation for first, second and third class passengers as well as most of the crew. An access corridor used by both crew and steerage ran almost the length of the ship on the port side, just behind this door. Named Scotland Road by the crew after the busy street in Liverpool, the 2.6 metre wide corridor allowed passengers to make their way to and from the dining saloons on F-Deck and crew to reach their quarters. This side of the door was strictly first class only and running down the starboard side were 45 staterooms. These rooms were alternative first or second class and were therefore not as luxurious as those on the decks above but still comfortable. Many contained mahogany furniture with white enamel brass beds. This stateroom was occupied by Margaret Brown, a wealthy American activist and philanthropist. She was heavily involved in workers' and women's rights and campaigned to support those less fortunate both before and after the accident. Margaret was holidaying in Egypt with friends when she received a message that her eldest grandson was seriously sick at home in the United States. She booked the earliest ship from Cherbourg back to New York, the RMS Titanic. In her interview with Colonel Archibald Gracie, she stated she was lying on her brass bed reading at the time of the accident. She felt the bump, but didn't think much of it and kept reading. It wasn't until she heard men talking about heading up on deck that she decided to find out what happened. One of the men told her to grab her life belt and head up onto the boat deck with them.
As they made their way up, she saw a group of men manually lowering the F-deck watertight doors from the access points in the floor here, directly outside of her cabin on E-deck. The men were joking around as they worked, so she thought it must only be precautionary. Margaret helped women board lifeboats on the port side of the ship before being persuaded to join lifeboat 6. She noticed her lifeboat was lacking rowers and organised people to take an oar. She tried to convince the passengers of her lifeboat to head back to the wreck and save those swimming but was met with opposition from the quartermaster in charge. Once on board RMS Carpathia, she organised a nine-member survivors committee who raised compensation funds for second and third class passengers and paid for passenger telegraph messages. The committee raised over $10,000 in the four days travel to New York, the equivalent of $234,000 in today's money. Margaret, along with two other first class women, organised daily counselling sessions held in the dining saloon and her fluency in French, German, Italian and Russian helped her console non-English speaking passengers. Margaret's efforts to help others on board, both Titanic and Carpathia, earned her respect, as did the determination of Carpathia's Captain Rostron. At a ceremony in New York, Titanic survivors presented Captain Rostron with a silver cup and golden medal to thank him for coming to their rescue and for the hospitality shown to them on board Carpathia. This watertight door is the one Margaret Brown watched being lowered from the floor above. On the other side of the door is the swimming bath and the linen storage rooms. Their state is unknown, although this area flooded around an hour after the accident and is expected to be in good condition due to the lack of water movement here. As we can see, the Turkish baths are well preserved. This was the cooling room and first class passengers would relax here after using the temperate, hot and steam rooms just off the side door. Passengers would change into towels using the change rooms in the starboard corner and store any valuables in the cabinet next to the vestibule. The passenger would then make their way down to the temperate room where they would sit or lay in the heat for 10 to 15 minutes. Here they would start to sweat before moving into the adjoining hot room. After spending another 5 to 10 minutes in the hot room, the passenger would either take a cold shower or a dip in the swimming bath next door, before making their way into the shampooing room. Here the passenger would lay on a marble table while an attendant gave them a full body wash and massage. Once dry and wrapped in clean towels, the passenger would make their way back to the cooling room where they would relax until their body returned to the normal temperature. The Turkish Baths is one of the best preserved areas on the ship, with most of the tiles, ceiling lanterns and wooden panelling still in place. The deep location within the wreck leaves it protected from destructive currents, although there is still sea life down here. The rust icicles, or rusticles, hanging from the ceiling are created by iron-eating bacteria. They come in different shapes and are incredibly fragile disintegrating when touched. Along with the bacteria, fungi, shells, sand, clay and coal can be found within the rusticles. Scientists have been collecting samples to determine the different strains of bacteria living on the ship and their research has been used to preserve oil and gas pipelines and safely dispose of old ships and oil rigs. As first class passengers rose up this staircase and made their way out onto the boat deck they would have passed the band playing in this alcove next to the entrance. The band consisted of eight musicians led by violinist Wallace Hartley. They usually played separately as a quintet and string trio at varying locations throughout the day. During the evacuation, the musicians began playing near the B-Deck restaurant before later moving up to this position near the forward grand staircase. They played mostly ragtime tunes to calm passengers standing nearby and draw passengers inside up to the boat deck. Some survivors state that the band played until the end and that the night was so quiet even those in lifeboats away from the ship could hear the music. Many survivors claim that the hymn Nearer My God to Thee was the last song played, although it was also reported to be Songed Autumna. Sadly, all eight members died during the sinking, with only three remains recovered by the cable ship Mackay Bennett. Wallace Hartley was one of them. 
found with his violin inside his case and strapped to his body. The violin was an engagement gift from his fiancée and it was returned to her following his death. Memorial monuments have been erected around the world to honour those who died at their posts as Titanic sank. The musicians playing on deck, the passengers who loaded lifeboats and then stood aside, the firemen and engineers keeping the dynamos running. The boilers standing here are part of boiler room 2 and were running until the end, powering the dynamos in the stern. A skeleton crew remained in the electrical engine room, redirecting power and keeping the lights on. This is the point where the keel failed and the massive ship began to tear itself apart. As so much of the ship between the bow and stern sections is scattered in the debris field, it's difficult to piece together the last moments of Titanic. Even those watching it happen couldn't agree with the inquiries held in both the United States and England producing contradicting accounts. Many expositions to find and raise the wreck were proposed over the years, with the exact location of her wreck being unknown. Titanic's coordinates sent out in distress on the night of the accident had been incorrect. On 1st of September 1985, a Canadian-French team were searching the area when Dr Robert Ballard came across some small debris. He followed the trail which led him to a boiler and eventually the wreck. His discovery confirmed suspicions that Titanic had in fact split and there was no hope of raising the wreck as a whole. Scientists and historians have long argued for and against the recovery of artefacts from the site while agreeing the site should be treated as a mass grave. Although it's predicted Titanic's wreck will disintegrate within the next 20 years, her story will intrigue generations to come.